Well, good morning to everyone. We'll go ahead and begin. Abba Father, in Christ's name and your Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for this day and this opportunity to gather here as sisters and brothers. Holy Spirit, we ask that you be our rabbi today. We love you so much and appreciate you, how faithful you are to meet with us, to teach us, to open our eyes and minds and ears, and we ask for that today. And help us to receive that which you have for us, that we might live for the glory of God, Yeshua, and you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I hope today, I pray today is uh, an encouragement to you. Uh, Holy Spirit has us in the Jacob narrative, and I think that um, you're going to find some things that may minister and speak to you for where you are uh, in your journey in the Lord right now. Well, I know this worked a moment ago. But it is not now. There we are. Genesis 27, 42 through 43 and 28, 10. Speaking to Jacob, behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. Of course, that's his mother's advice to him. Beersheba means well of the sevenfold oath. And Haran is a dry and parched place. So in the journey of your identity and purpose in the Lord, you will, at points, find yourself in a place you cannot stay while looking toward a place that seems dry or undesirable or even fearsome at first glance. But it's in those times that you remember his oath and promise to you. Remember those things. Remember those sevenfold oaths, so to speak. The Jacob situation here, of course, and some of that obviously is by his own doing because of what uh, he had done with his brother. But he's in a situation where he cannot stay where he is. And there are times in our lives when that's exactly right. We, we know we can't stay here. But when we look at the options in the landscape before us, uh, that seems dry or parched or even fearsome. And it's like, wow, I'm just in no man's land. I'm not in a good spot. But it's in times like that you remember God's promises to you, his oaths to you, who you are in Christ, what he's put in your heart. Hang on to those promises because God's going to operate through them. And there's a divine intersection. And he came to a certain place, verse 11, came to his pagah, and it means to encounter, to meet, to reach, to touch a boundary, to reach the mark. It also means to make intercession. Certain place is my home, and it's a standing place, a position, an office, a post, a city, land, or region. So Abba always guides your journey in him, and he divinely leads you, and often, I would say most of the time, without your awareness. He's leading you to certain places for specific reasons. So here's Jacob. He's in a place he cannot stay, He's got to go, and he looks at the landscape, and he doesn't really see necessarily a, a hopeful future or uh, what's ahead of him, but God's with him because he has the birthright and the blessing. The birthright is the right of Christ. We have the right of Christ, and we have our Father's blessing in him. So that's with us. We need to remember that. But when you get yourself in a situation or you find yourself in a situation Again, where you can't stay, but going forward is also fearsome or troublesome. Remember who you are in Christ. Remember who God is and what he has said to you. And he's guiding you. Even when you can't see it, even when you don't understand it, he's guiding you. He's with you. And he is working to bring you to a certain place, a standing place, because he has specific reasons in that. Well, there's no more natural light. And they stayed there that night because the sun had set. 
So Jacob's journey was arrested by a practical need. He could no longer see. I mean, this is bottom line. That's why he stopped where he stopped, because there was no more sunlight. They couldn't see where they were going, so they just had to stop. So when you stop living your life by the natural light of what you can see, you find yourself in a place where you can perceive by supernatural light. And this is the opportunity to gain new perspective and understanding of what you previously could not, what is really going on around you. So again, in this narrative, we see Jacob can't stay where he is, going somewhere else, doesn't know what that's going to look like, doesn't look great to him. In this journey, he has to stop because he can't see anymore. And this is really a type for all of us because all of us in our journey with the Lord, you're going to get to places where you just can't see anymore. You know, you, you, your vision for what's next is just not there. But when you stop, trying to perceive it with your natural mind, natural light, if you will, that's when you actually have the opportunity to start seeing it from God's perspective. That's a place where you can receive supernatural light. You can get God's vision over that circumstance. And resting on the rock, taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. Verse 11, under his head is Merashah. It's a feminine noun. It means place at the head or dominion. Lay down is Shekav, and it means relax, rest, sleep. It also is used in the Hebrew for intimate physical relations between a husband and a wife, and it also it means to die. So complete rest and total surrender on the rock, who is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3, 4, puts you in proper position to hear, see, and receive from heaven's perspective. Galatians 2.20, Paul talked about, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. So we have a word picture here. We have imagery of Jacob. Jacob has a promise. He has a blessing on his life. He has an oath on his life. Can't stay where he was. Not sure about where he's going, what that's going to look like. Got his brother pursuing him. And he's in his journey, he has to stop because he just can't see anymore. So in that moment, then he takes a rock, he lays down on the ground. He's in a surrendered state, a state of death, if you will. No, he's not living by his own energy. He's not standing on his own energy. He puts his head on the rock to go to sleep. And that is a picture of us resting our head, our thoughts, our minds on Jesus, on Yeshua. So see that in your mind. That's the picture here is we have Jacob with all these things going on. He's in a rested state. He's in a surrendered state. And his head is specifically on the rock. And so when you're in that place, when you can't see in that journey, when you choose to surrender your own energy, your strengths, your abilities to lay out, to die before Christ and put your head on him, so that he can speak to you, so that he can give you what you need, what you need to see, what you need to understand. That's the place and the space where things can really start happening for you. And no natural barriers. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Verse 12. Of course, later Christ appropriated this to himself in John 1 he said to him truly truly I say to you you will see heaven opened and the angel of God ascending and descending on the son of man so Christ is saying I'm the ladder of access I, I am that that's what Jacob is seeing in that so when you're in a place of complete surrender in Christ which is no natural dependence or perception when you stop trying to figure it out on your own fix it on your own do it by your own energy when you're in that place, it's in that time and place that you gain spiritual vision and access needed to accomplish God's heavenly will on earth. And that's key. Well, specific position and land in verse 13. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. So Abba personally came to stand beside his son to speak intimately to him. 
So when you carry a spiritual leadership mantle from God through personal intimacy with him, you're given spiritual authority over the territories in which you're placed and are fully surrendered to his purposes in them. So Jacob, really not by his own design, finds himself in this place, has no more natural light, has to stop, does stop, surrenders himself, is, is laid out, is completely surrendered of his own energy, his own thoughts, his own purposes. He is resting his head on the rock who is Christ. That's the type there. And it's in that place and in that time that God begins to speak to him. And he says to him, this is a place where you have my mantle, you have my blessing. This is a specific location. You're in a totally surrendered state. And it's in this place that I'm showing you, Jacob, that this territory, this land belongs to you. It belongs to your descendants forever. So it's a specific position and specific land. An exponential blessing in verse 14. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So he's carrying on Abraham's blessing there. The fruit of your surrendered obedience is not limited to one territory alone, but it continues to expand throughout the earth by his spirit. So when you're in this spiritual state, when you're in a surrendered state, your head is resting on Christ, your energy is all in him, and God's wisdom is flowing into you, and he puts you in a position, a particular place, a particular sphere of influence, then he will use that, he will flow into you and through you into that place. But your influence in him, the kingdom influence is not limited to that place, it's not going to stop there. It just, it, it, it emanates from there but it will go in all directions. And treasure his promises in verse 15. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. Behold is shamar and it means to keep, guard, observe, watch, protect, treasure up in memory. So Abba never forgets or fails to keep his promises. It's essential for you to protect and treasure them in your heart and mind in order to receive and steward them well. So you need to remind yourself, we need to remind ourselves daily of who God is, what his promises are to us, who we are in him, and what's going on. You need to be intentional about that because you can know that God never fails to fulfill his promises. He never breaks a word, ever. And that's a strength to you. It's a strength to me. Treasure his promises. Think about those promises in those dark places when you can't see how to go forward, when you don't know what's going on, when you feel like the enemies are uh, coming after you. Treasure the promises of the Lord. Treasure his oath to you. And just as a side note here, to reinforce that in the New Testament, in 1 Timothy 1.18 Paul was writing to Timothy, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the good fight. Some render that wage the good warfare. Fight is stratumai, and it means serve in a military campaign or lead in battle. So Paul taught that knowing who you are in the Lord what he has mantled you to do, and his promise for fulfillment. We see in uh, Psalm 57, too, that God will fulfill his promises to us. Knowing that is essential to successfully waging war against the plots and attacks of the enemy against you. And this keeps you in the offensive and protects your mind from the lies that would disarm and defeat you. Paul was telling Timothy this. He's saying, Timothy, you wage the good battle, you wage the good warfare, you fight the good fight in what you're called to do by remembering who Jesus is, who you are in him, what he's called you to do. And you stay with that. You stay with that narrative. You stay with that story. You stay with that truth. You stay with those promises because no matter what else is going on around you, those things will not bring you down because you know the truth even when you can't see it with your natural eyes around you. So that's how you fight well. But you can wreck the ship too. 
And Paul went on to say, by rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith. Shipwreck is nageo, and it means cause or suffer a shipwreck. So Paul continued to strengthen his admonition by pointing to the opposite also being true. Specifically, if one will not wage war by knowing and standing on God's promises, that one will surely wreck his or her ship of faith and fail in that time. Now, that's not that it's irrevocable, but it's just a fact. So Paul's saying it's either or, Timothy and us. You're either going to stand on the promises of God each day, you're going to know the truth, you're going to believe the truth, or by rejecting this, you're going to shipwreck yourself. And there's no, there's nothing in the middle there. Well, soul activation, let's go back to Jacob. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Awoke is your hats. It means awakened or become active. And know is your die, and it means to know by experience, perceive and see, and also a word for physical intimacy in Hebrew. So when Abba gives you something by his spirit, you must choose to activate it in your soul to fully come to embrace and know it. This awareness must become of your part of your conscious thought because you do not sleep or dream your way through life. You actively live it. You know, think about a dream. Um, when you wake up in the morning, if you'd been dreaming right before you woke up, right when you wake up, there's a conscious memory of that dream but if you don't consciously take it in and think about it, you're going to lose it. Probably all of us have had that experience where you just, you know, 10 minutes after you wake up, you're like, I had a dream, but now I forgot what it was. But you were, you were remembering it right when you woke up, but you did not bring it into your conscious mind. You didn't embrace it. And so therefore you lose it. Well, see, that's the same thing here. When God gives you something, you have to consciously think about it. You have to embrace it make it part of your conscious state. This is something that you see with your mind throughout the day. It's not just in a dream state. You've got to bring soul activation to it. Remember, your soul is your thoughts, emotions, and will. You have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. And the body only obeys what's in the soul. It doesn't obey what's in the spirit. So you've got to take what's in the spirit and bring it into your soul. And then that's what activates it. So that's key. So there's soul activation here. When he woke up, then he's consciously saying, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. So he's bringing this into his consciousness in his daily life. He's bringing it into his mind. Because if he doesn't do this, he could lose this. He could lose this dream. He could lose this vision and lose the impact of it. Well, anointing the rock at the gate, verse 17 and he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. Interestingly, this is the very first mention of the practice of anointing in the scriptures. The word anointing is not used here, but this is what's being practiced. This is the first time that it ever appears in the scriptures. So Jacob's action paints a profound picture of the person, anointing, and purpose of Christ in the earth. You remember that rock represents Christ. He's rested his head on that rock. He's anointing that rock. He's, he's bringing all of this thing into his consciousness. He's acting upon it. He's doing something physically in the natural to bring activation of this. And this is painting this picture of Christ. Christ is the rock and the gate. He's the cornerstone and the way. He's the Messiah, the anointed one. Christos, Christ means anointed one. Mashiach, Messiah means anointed one. He's the anointed one, and he restores full access to God, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. So this is a profound atomic moment that Jacob wandered into. Now, God was directing it, and he didn't see it, but he did become aware of it, and when he did, he activated it. He took it into himself, and then he did something in the natural to establish it. 
and watching over that certain place, he being Jacob called the name of that place Bethel, 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 which means house of God. But the name of the city was Luz, which means almond tree at the first. In Jeremiah 1 11, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. God watches his own word to perform it himself. So almond trees represent wakefulness and watching in scripture, as well as hastening. So Abba had watched and protected this place to reveal it and give it to Jacob and his spiritual descendants forever. And he's leading you to his certain place as well. What you can know today, sister or brother, if you're in Jesus Christ, if you're born again in him, if you have said to him, I want to serve you, I want to follow you, you're my king, you're my savior, you're my Lord, you're my brother, I want to serve you, then you can know Holy Spirit has entered you. So you're with God, God's with you. And every single one of us today is in a journey with him, every single one of us. And he has certain places that he's guiding all of us. And he's been protecting those places. He knows what, what's there. He knows what he wants to accomplish there. He knows what he wants to release there. So in this, just stay with the promise of who you are in Christ. And as you keep walking, and when you get to those places, when you can't see by your natural sight, you know, it, it was making sense yesterday, not so much today, then just stand on that promise and know that wherever you are, you know, if you're not in rebellion, if, if you've chosen to run away from the Lord, if you're choosing sin, if you're choosing rebellion, that's one thing, you're, you're off in the weeds. But if you're saying, Lord, I want what you want, I don't know what that is, I don't know what to do next, I don't really even know where I'm going, be at peace, because he does, and he's got you, and he's guiding you in ways that you don't even know or understand, but he's with you, it's okay. And so he's leading you a certain place. He's been protecting that place. And he's going to accomplish his purposes in that place. He's watching over his word to perform it. He's the one who accomplishes it, not us. We're just in agreement with him and, and flowing with him in that. Well, Holy Spirit took me to Psalm 105, 16, 22. And of course, this is the, this is the Joseph narrative, but it has so much... Uh, for us today when he summoned famine against the land and cut off every supply of bread he had sent a man ahead of them joseph who had been sold as a slave his feet were hurt with fetters his neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass the word of the lord kept testing him the king sent and released him the ruler of the people set him free he made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to instruct his officials at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. Now, what we see here is that Joseph had a vision, had a dream, had something from God, had an oath from God, and, and Joseph had accepted it. But between that moment and the fulfillment of it is rejection by his brothers slavery and prison but the fact of the matter is the oath was still there the promise was there and unbeknownst to joseph and certainly beyond his understanding god is actually guiding him he's in him with in this journey and he's taking joseph to a certain place and that certain place was egypt and god had purposes in that now, joseph certainly didn't understand that initially but this entire time it says until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord kept testing him. He kept being tested. Are you going to continue to believe me, Joseph? Are you going to continue to trust me? You, you know I gave you that vision. You know I gave you that dream. You know I gave you that mantle. And you said yes to it, but here you are. Well, you're in that journey, and you're in a place where you don't have any more natural light. You, you really can't see what's going on. But he kept being tested. Are you still going to believe me? Are you still going to trust me? And years later, the answer is yes. Joseph allowed God to continue to form his heart, his character, his mind, so that he could fulfill his purposes. So the right heart plus the right place plus the right time equals fulfillment of God's purposes. If any one of these three factors are not in place, then there's not fulfillment. 
But here's the thing, you may have the right heart, and I pray, hope, and believe that everybody in this room right now has a right heart with the Lord. But maybe you're not in the right place yet. Uh, necessarily physically, maybe just spiritually. Or you have the right heart, the right place, but it's not quite the right time. See, for Joseph, for all those years, he did have the right heart, and he was in the right place, but it wasn't the right time. But when Joseph's right heart, which was in the right place, met the right time, bam, the prison door opens, and he finds himself standing in front of Pharaoh, and the fulfillment of God's purpose is on him. Well, this formula is true all the time. It's true for you and me and us today. Now, the right heart thing is something that we have to work with him. We have to be intentional about that and letting Holy Spirit work in us and, and change our minds and, and you know weed out whatever's in our souls that needs to go. That's that process, and that's what he's doing with Joseph in that process. But the right place and the right time, that's up to God because in the journey, he has to guide you to the right place, and then he's the only one who can handle the timing. But when all those three are lined up, then this fulfillment of God's purposes, and God promises us he's going to fulfill his purposes for us as long as we stay with him in it. And finally this, a place of pain is a place to reign. In Isaiah 65, 10, sharing will be a pasture for flocks, and the valley of Accor, a place for herds to lie down, for my people who have sought me. Hosea 2.15, there I will give her vineyards back to her and make the valley of Accor into a gateway of hope. Accor means trouble or causing sorrow. So here's the thing, evil attacks what God intends to bless. For those who continue to seek the Lord and depend upon Him, He turns their certain place of pain and sorrow into the very place they come to reign in Him. You know, going back to the Joseph narrative, I mean, Egypt, <laughs> up until the point that he's standing before Pharaoh, that place wasn't anything but a place of suffering and sorrow for him. I mean, he's missing his family. He, he's missing life that he knew. Uh, it was a difficult place. That was his accord, a place of suffering and sorrow. But God says, in me, I turn that place into a place of joy and a gateway of hope. And that's exactly what happened. And it was in that place that he actually met his destiny and fulfilled his destiny in the Lord. And that's true for you. What, whatever suffering, your challenge or hardship you're going through right now, and it's painful, God knows that. But you know, if your heart is after him and you're standing on his promises, when the time is right, he is going to flip that and he's going to make that place a place for you to reign. Because evil attacks what God intends to bless. You know, whatever it may be, and it, it may not be something that's like a practical territory, it's like a spiritual experience. You know, but people who come through something in the Lord have a particular authority over that. For instance, somebody who's been through drug addiction and knows the hell of that, in Jesus Christ, when they overcome that, they have a particular authority to deal with other people who are going through that in a way that I wouldn't. I don't know what that experience is like. Now, I can speak the truth to those ones, and that's true, and I can pray for them and bless them, and that's all true. But somebody who's actually been through drug addiction in Jesus and comes out the other side, they have a particular place to reign. You see what I'm saying? And that's true for everything. So every sorrow you've been through, every hardship you've been through in Jesus Christ, if you stayed with him in that journey and you've allowed him to bring fulfillment and victory in that, you have particular authority over that in the earth. Profound authority. It's also true physically in territories as well. You know, and you, you've been to a physical place and been through something, then in that territory, you have a particular spiritual power and authority in Jesus Christ. So that is key. Your place of pain is actually the place you're intended to reign, whatever you're going through. Father, we thank you so much for your living word to us today. Holy Spirit, your desire is to comfort us today. You're the comforter and the encourager. You're wanting us to see something maybe we had lost sight of today. Lord, everybody in this room knows what hardship is like. There's people right now probably in a tough place, feel like they can't stay where they are, don't know how to go 
to what's next, or maybe they see what's next and it looks fearful. But Father, you're guiding us to a certain place. And if our heart is with you, if we have surrendered to you and we've said, Lord, please help me. I, wa I want what you want. I want to be what you want me to be. I just don't know how to get there. Then we can know, Lord, that you've got that heart. And you're leading us to a certain place and a certain timing. And, and when all those three things come together, there's fulfillment. And there's fulfillment you have planned for every single heart in this room today. You're leaving no one in the wilderness. You're leaving no one out there to die. So, Father, we receive your encouragement today. What we can do, what our part is, Lord, is to give our heart to you and surrender ourselves to you. Be like Jacob, just in a state of death before you. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. I, Lord, I'm not going to live by my own energy today. I'm not going to live by my own eyesight today. I'm not going to live by my mind or my understanding. I want yours. And I'm going to rest my head on Christ. And Holy Spirit, we know in Christ that you're speaking to us and you'll guide us. And then when you do choose to speak, when you do choose to reveal, Lord, then we want to be like Jacob. We want to take that into ourselves. We want to activate it. Don't want to let it just pass by, because there is choice in that. But Father, in this time, right now, I pray your blessing upon your sisters and brothers, Jesus, and I just thank you for them, and Lord, everybody in this room is pursuing you. They've got other things to do. They could be somewhere else today, but they're pursuing you. So bless them today, Lord, as you intend. May they receive what you're saying, and may they be encouraged today. And we thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Grace and peace to you today.